Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for life. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the word of truth and the testimony of Jesus. We pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters who are at the camp meeting, that they might have a great season of renewal. Our thoughts are with them. And also, we pray, Lord, that you would be here with us as we study your word together. We love you, and we are grateful for who you are and what you've done for us in Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Amen. brothers and sisters, we are few in number today, and that's all right. We know where our other brothers and sisters are. And sometimes, when even when we're few in number, we can still have a rich season. I think about Jesus in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus came to see him at night, that conversation is probably one of the richest theological conversations in the whole Bible. And it reveals one of the greatest truths of the entire word, right? It's one of the verses that is most famous in the whole world, right? John 3, 16, right? Well, that was yeah. said to one person. So whether there's many people or whether there's even just one person, that doesn't matter, right? We can get into God's word and the richness of it. And it also reminds me of, I heard a story and I don't know all the details of it, but apparently there was an Adventist evangelist who was doing some meetings and he was disappointed because only one person showed up to his meeting. And he was discouraged, but then God told him, hey, go out there and preach. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to preach to that one person. And then apparently that one person accepted the message and, and received it. And that person turned out to be Mark Finley. So you never know what God will do, whether there's many people or few people. We just got to present the message and let the seed be sown and let God do what he's going to do, right? Today, you know, I've been having some dialogue back and forth with a few of our Trinitarian brothers and sisters online. And so we're not going to do our normal Hebrews study, which I think we'll be doing that next week. But so instead, I thought, let me share some things about some of the dialogue that I've been having with these brothers and sisters, because they're things that I think um, can be helpful to us and to help us to have an understanding and specifically, we want to deal with today about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how humanity can help us to understand a little bit better the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, in the Adventist world today, there is tremendous confusion about this. And that is because SDAs are trying to fit in with the larger religious world by claiming the doctrine of the Trinity. And because the doctrine of the Trinity is actually an assumption, it's not actually spelled out in the Bible anywhere, it kind of opens up Pandora's box and people start making up all sorts of things to try to explain it. And they end up kind of confused because the doctrine itself doesn't exist there. And so then the, all the stuff that they're saying to try to explain that doctrine also doesn't exist there as well. And then they get quite mixed up. So instead of doing that, what I'd like to do is to look at the Bible itself and to share from God's word. And we'll also supplement with the testimonies how he wants us to understand. So we'll begin by going into Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 19 and verse 20. And this is Paul. He's beginning his letter, and he's opening up sort of a contrast between the Gentiles and the Jews and the things that God has revealed. And here he's talking to the Gentiles, and he's talking about what God has revealed to them. So this is the generic revelation 
that is for everyone. It's different from the specific revelation that God gives through his word and his law. But we're looking at this, and this is going to be a key verse as we go into this subject. So again, that's Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. And the Bible says there, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So if you caught it, Paul said there that there was something about God that could be understood, right? Even his eternal power and Godhead, and that word simply just means divinity. And it says that they can be understood by the things that are made, right? So this is our biblical framework to try to understand the Godhead. It's going to be through something that has been made. Now, many years ago, I think it was back in 2018, I was uh, doing a presentation in front of several of the professors at Southern Adventist University. And they challenged me about what I was sharing about how Adam and Eve parallel God and his only begotten son. And they said, well, look, you're trying to explain these things through something that is created or something that's made. And I said, yes, because that's exactly what Romans 1 verse 19 and 20 says, that there's something that's made whereby we can explain these things. But my challenge to them was that in Adventist Trinitarian theology, our brothers and sisters try to explain God through all sorts of things like a triangle, the three parts of music, a tricycle, uh, three forms of water, light, three dolls, three cord of strand, all of these things. And I'm sure you guys have heard some of those before. And so they try to use all of these object lessons from things that are made, but they ignore the one thing in the entire Bible that is actually said, expressly said to be made in the image and likeness of God. And so let's go there and read that verse now. And this is Genesis chapter 1, and we are going to look at verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And we'll read verse, verse 27 as well. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So here we see the one thing in the entire Bible that is said to be made in God's image and likeness is mankind. It is Adam and Eve. So for me, it's always kind of been a bit of a strange thing about how our friends, they go to something like a triangle or they go to something like light or water, but they ignore the one thing in the entire Bible that is said to be in God's image and likeness. And I want to... I'm about to, Jason, the screen yeah. has not moved since you have it up with us. You see, I think this is saying something about Adam and Eve. Um, did you mean to have to be changing the screen to the scriptures that you're reading, or you just have it there? Oh, no, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be going to the scriptures. I was just oh. reading those. What I'm going to no, do is I'm going to take you down on this page and just kind of oh. go through some of the things there. All right. No problem. Okay, then. All right. Excellent. Now, this is just a bit of a, as an aside, before we get into this, I've been talking with a, a few people here lately, and it seems like they have this view that 
when God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, they believed that was three persons talking to himself. And so they sort of have this view, I guess, that the Holy Spirit must be a bodily personage that is just like the Father or the Son. So it's like they have these three, I guess, bodily persons there. And I've, I often said that seems unusual to me because I've never seen anywhere in all of inspiration where the Holy Spirit is said to be all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, like we can read about God's Son or in the testimonies that the Father is said to be all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I never see that about the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the Hebrew, that word actually means like to hover. In the King James, it'll say moved over the face of the waters, and that's true too, but it's more specifically, it's actually that the Spirit was hovering. And what I've said to them is like, do we hover? No, we don't. That to me is just another indication that we're dealing with something more mysterious when it comes to the spirit and that the spirit itself is not an explicit part of this equation in terms of when God spoke. And so let's go into Genesis 1.26. And you can see here on the screen that we're going to deal with several points. And this is understanding Genesis 1, verse 26. I actually wrote this document in response to a Seventh-day Adventist minister who was saying that the doctrine I was sharing of showing a parallel between God the Father and his only begotten Son with Adam and Eve, he said that it was strange and, and very odd. And to me, what that reveals is how even our Adventist brothers and sisters they can get into their own traditions. And because they're so often correct about things that they end up thinking that like they're correct about everything, you know? And so it's actually kind of a sad thing to me because it reveals a closed mindedness. And the same thing can happen. Like say you're talking to one of our Roman Catholic friends or to a very conservative Protestant. Well, they go by tradition too. And so for them, the Lord's Day is Sunday. And if you try to show them that actually, no, that's not really in the Bible. In the Bible, the Lord's Day would actually be the seventh day Sabbath. But they have heard their tradition for so long that the truth sounds strange and it sounds odd to them. And so I think for this pastor that, you know, I was speaking with, for him, he had this idea in his head that he probably heard all his life and so that when someone comes along and tries to say, actually, let's look at Adam and Eve to try to help us understand God and his son, that seemed strange and odd to him. But we're going to see that biblically speaking, and even according to the testimony of Jesus, it actually makes a whole lot of sense. So we already read Genesis 1.26, right? That God said, let us make man in our image. And this was not a three-person being, or it wasn't even three separate God beings talking to himself or amongst themselves. This was actually God speaking to his son. In the Hebrew, the verb to say is in the singular. So when it says God said, it's actually meaning one person was talking to another. And we see uh, quite a few quotes here in the testimony of Jesus, right? Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. And I saw that when God said to his son, let us make man in our image. Here's a really great one. It's Manuscript 43, 1906, Paragraph 6. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Whom did he address? The Lord Jesus Christ, who declares himself to have been with the Father from the beginning. Manuscript 236, 1902. 
we take not the fallacies of man, but the word of God, that man was created after the image of God and Christ, right? One more, Review and Herald, February 24th, 1874, paragraph 3. God, in counsel with his son, formed the plan of creating man in their own image. Now, this is a really wonderful truth that we are made after the image and likeness of God. Uh, the book of James actually says to us that we are made in the similitude, the, or the likeness of God. And this shows the great value of humanity, right? In a certain sense, we can say that human beings are the children of God because we are created in his image and likeness. And specifically, it's not just the image and likeness of God, but it's the image and likeness of God and his son, right? Here in this week, I've been trying to work on a book manuscript that I'm putting together, and it's really about the family of God. And it's trying to show that the great paradigm whereby we are to understand the universe, where we are to understand both humans and angels, and also presumably the inhabitants of the other worlds, is actually a family model because everything actually flows out from God the Father and his only begotten Son. It is a paternal relationship that is the foundation of the universe existence and specifically the intelligent beings that God has made, whether they be angels or men, they were created to be a part of his family. And this actually has to do with partaking of the divine nature and God sharing his spirit and indwelling these beings. It's really all about this close and intimate family that God wanted to have. And of course, um, Lucifer is the first being to really rebel and break out of that family relationship that God and Christ had made. That's a sad thing. But let's move forward because we're really dealing with the image and likeness of the Father and Son. Jesus said in John 5, 37, the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. That is a very important Bible verse to know. Because these days, in the larger Christian world, many people actually think that God is formless. But Jesus himself taught us that God has a shape. Early writings, page 54, says, this is Sister White. She was in vision, and she was speaking with Jesus, and she said, I asked Jesus is if, if his father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Just, that's, wow. So, God the Father has a form, and in this sinful mortal bodies that we currently inhabit, we cannot actually see the Father in his full glory. No one has actually seen the Father's face among sinful mankind. And if we did, we would cease to exist. But the time is coming through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ when he is going to transform this sinful nature and these sinful bodies into his sinless, his glorified immortal body, right? And then we will be able to see the Father's face again. Anyhow, I'm getting a little bit off of the topic here, but that is the whole purpose of what we are focused on and what we are moving towards and the whole preaching of the gospel and the whole understanding these truths is to get us ready to be able to see God our Father again. And that will be a glorious day. Let's keep moving forward. So the, our point here is that God has a tangible form or shape, and his son had the same. 
So we're dealing with two tangible persons, the father and the son in whose image and likeness mankind was created. The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, speaking about Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, says, the Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen man. He was as of much more value than man as his noble spotless character and exalted office as commander of all the heavenly hosts were above the work of man. He was in the express image of his father, not in features alone, but in perfection of character. And this is something that I think oftentimes people don't really think about, like what Jesus existed as and what he looked like before he came to become one of us, right? We're very egocentric creatures, right? We tend to think about things purely from the Earth's perspective or from the human perspective. And that's understandable, but sometimes we need to stop and think about from the heaven perspective or from the universal perspective about Jesus. In fact, Philippians chapter 2 actually encourages us to think that way. Let's go to that passage. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5, says this, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So there, Paul is actually saying to have the same type of thoughts, to have the same type of mind that was in Christ Jesus. And he starts by actually taking us back to the pre-incarnate Christ and says that he existed in the form of God, right? So, so our thought process as Christians is to be a contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just in his humanity, right? But we're actually to go back and to think of him before that, when he was existing in the form of God. Youth Instructors, December 20th, 1900, says, before Christ came in the likeness of men, he existed in the express image of his Father. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 39, says before Christ left heaven and came into the world to die, he was taller than any of the angels. He was majestic and lovely. So think about this, like this glorious personage, this beautiful being who is the express image of of God the Father, right? Taller than any of the angels, like with this visible glory that outshone from him. That's who we are to contemplate. And in truth, I don't think we can even really fully grasp it because we've never even, even seen it, right? But in your imagination, if you can think about just how magnificent he must have been and what he looked like. And this is what we're to think of. And then that he exchanged that to become one of us. And not even like Adam, like the, the pre-fall Adam, but rather a human being after thousands of years of sin. And not just that, as if that weren't enough of a, a condescension, but he did that to suffer and to die for us. Like... What an amazing character uh, the Lord Jesus really is. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45. Man was to bear God's image, both in outward resemblance and in character. Christ alone is the express image, Hebrews 1 verse 3, of the Father. But man was formed in the likeness of God. His nature was in harmony with the will of God. 
okay? So Christ is the express image, right? The, the duplicate, if you will, the one who's just like the Father. But humanity was made to resemble God to a degree in our physical and in our spiritual. And I want to take a moment to touch upon the sisters as well, because sometimes in this world, men get puffed up, right? They think they got all the power and the strength and the glory, but not according to the Bible. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 26 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. This last past Friday, we have a small group that meets out here, and there's a sister who, who comes to that group. And I appreciate this sister very much because she just has like this refining influence, you know, and you can, when her presence is there at the meeting, you could sense it, you can tell it, the things that she says and the way that she carries herself. And it's just such a blessing. And I see reflection of the divine image in her through her ministry. And it's different from me. There are verses in scripture where God says that, like, can a mother forget the child of her womb? Even if she could forget, I will not forget. And so God is using a mother's love to portray an aspect of himself, right? To show us part of his character. Jesus said to Jerusalem, right? He said that I wanted to cover you like a mother hen would cover the chicks, but you were would not. And so there's this aspect there, this nurturing, right, that we're seeing in the divine character of the son. And so I just think it's a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing, how the image of God is reflected male and female. And this, of course, the great example of this for us is Adam and Eve. So let's move forward. And I'm going to try to, I guess, speed up here a little bit. And we're really just kind of showing some points of how Adam and Eve help us to understand the Godhead as it is reflected in the Father and Son. We know, of course, the, the famous verse in Scripture is John 3.16, which tells us that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Sister White explains to us in Signs of the Times, May 30th, 1895, what that means, that expression, God's only begotten son. She says that this means not a son by creation, as were the angels, nor a son by adoption, as is the forgiven sinner, but a son begotten in the express image of the father's person and in all the brightness of his majesty and glory, one equal with God in authority, dignity, and divine perfection, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, the plain reading of John 3.16 would suggest to us that God had an only begotten son whom he gave. And if we even think about this Signs of the Times, May 30th, 1895 quote, it is talking about a description of the son, what he was in his pre-incarnate existence. Because when he came down here to this earth, it was actually to become a son by creation. His human nature is created. But here in this quote, we're talking about him not as a son by creation, as were the angels. We also see that it speaks about him as begotten in all the brightness of the Father's majesty and glory. Well, as we keep rolling down this screen, you will actually see that there are many, many quotes, and this is just a small sampling, that explain that Jesus had two ways that he was the brightness of the Father's glory. You see? One way that he was the brightness, and this is pre-incarnate, this was in his physical appearance. Like before he came, when he existed in the form of God, he was a dazzling being. He had a physical glory to him. And 
It's also used in a metaphorical sense to talk about his character, the glory of his character, like the beauty and radiance of his unselfish love, right? But when he came into this world, the physical glory was veiled. It was covered up, right? We're seeing in Testimonies, volume 8, page 265, Christ, the light of the world, veiled the dazzling splendor of his divinity and came to live as a man among men that they might, without being consumed, become acquainted with their creator. And all of these other quotes explain that if he had shown up in his divine form, we, we couldn't have even looked at him, right? Uh, the glory would have been too overwhelming. So we could not even look on one of the unfallen angels, right? If Gabriel was to show up direct from heaven in front of us and in all of the glory that Gabriel has, we couldn't even look at Gabriel, right? And so now we're talking about the son of God, the one by whom God actually created Gabriel, right? We're talking about the express image of God. So if we can't even look at Gabriel in Gabriel's full glory, then how much less could we have looked at Christ, right? Look what it says. Had he come in the full power and glory of his divinity, sinners could not have stood in his presence without being destroyed. So it was a part of the plan that he should hide the brightness of his glory, that during his earthly life, he should humble himself to man's estate. And again, remember what we read in Philippians 2, you know, that consider Christ, have that same type of mind, like if he was willing to humble himself and to divest himself of that form of God, to hide all of this glory, right, then we should also be willing to humble ourselves to help others. There's no condescension that to try to bring salvation to someone else, to teach them the gospel, that we should humble ourselves too. We should think in the same type of way, okay? But so we're seeing just some of these kind of parallels, and we're going to tie them back in with Adam and Eve as we move forward. But here's something that's really uh, wonderful to think about. This is point three. The Son of God is actually the Father's glory. He is a part of God himself. And this is in Hebrews chapter one, verse three. It says that the Son is the express image of his person, of the Father's person. But the Greek word there, and there's actually two Greek words there. One is caricature, and the other is hypostasis. And what those words actually mean is the first one is talking about like a seal. Like an ancient king, they used to have like these stamps that was a seal, and they put them in wax, and then they pressed the seal down on a paper, and it created a duplicate of the seal. It was the express image of it. It looked just like the seal. That is the word that is being used for Christ. And then hypostasis means substance. It's actually the same word that's used in Hebrews 11, verse 1, where it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the tangible reality. It's that. And so when it's saying that he is the express image of his person, it's, it's actually saying that he is like the duplicate. He is the replica of God's substance, okay? Meaning he's the same essence. Letter 361, 1890. Though sin had produced a gulf between man and his God, Divine benevolence provided a plan to bridge that gulf. And what material did he use? A part of himself. The brightness of the Father's glory came to a world all seared and marred with the curse, and in his own divine character, in his own divine body, bridged the gulf and opened a channel of communication between God and man. So what we are talking about here is we are talking about the son of God's very substance. He is different from angels who were spoken into existence, right? 
He is different from man, who man was, was formed from the dust of the earth. We are talking about the son who came from God's very self, right? That's why he's a part of himself, his very material. He is what the father is. In Signs of the Times, November 27th, 1893, Sister White tells us that, of speaking of Christ, that he and the Father were of one substance, possessing the same attributes. So this is as high as high can go. There is no higher type of being. We are talking the Son of God's very nature, the Son who shares the same substance or material or essence as the Father himself, okay? So this is a really, like, the exaltation of Christ is something that is hard to even express, like how great, how high, how exalted, how mighty, how wonderful, how powerful he is. He is the same as God in his substance, right? There's nothing that the Father can do that the Son lacks the power to do. He has the same attributes, the same omnipotence, right? So this is who humbled himself. I mean, just what a contrast, guys, between Lucifer, the highest created angel, right, who says, I want to be like the Most High, when we compare him to the only begotten Son of God, who is equal to his Father, who has this same substance, and he says, no, I'm, I do not count equality with the Father something to be grasped, right? He's the only Son who actually has the right to be on that same level, and his personality is such that he doesn't even think of himself that way, and will actually step way, way, way down to serve others, even to rescue us, right? So that goes back to that Philippians 2, to have that same type of mind in you that Christ Jesus had. What an incredible contrast between him and the rebellious cherub. But moving forward, point four. Eve, she was created to be a suitable helper for Adam. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. That verb meet there means suitable. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8 and 9, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So uh, Eve was created to be a suitable helper for Adam in accomplishing the work that God had assigned to him. Adam was not of Eve, but Eve was of Adam. All right, and let's keep moving forward to point five, and we're going to start um, tying all of these data points together here shortly. But the son was actually under God. Now, we're talking about the pre-incarnate Christ, not just the incarnate Christ. And this is a point that I've had a lot of conflict about with, with some of my uh, Trinitarian brothers and sisters. They don't particularly like these aspects, but, but they're true. 1 Corinthians 11, and I'll turn there in my Bible, it says this, and I'm reading verse 3, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, what this is actually talking about is saying that the head of all humanity of all mankind, you could also translate that. The head of every man, you could also translate that. The head of all mankind is Christ. And then when it says the head of the woman is man, you could also understand that as saying the head of the wife is the husband. In the Greek, the word for woman and wife is the same, and the word for man and husband is the same. This is important to understand because some men erroneously think that just because they're a man, they're in charge of all women. No, absolutely not. 
the headship relationship in the genders exists within marriage. The head of all of mankind is Christ Jesus himself. So he's the head of all humans, whether male or female. And then there's a lower level of headship that exists in the marriage relationship where the husband is the head of the wife. And then we see that the head of Christ is God. So God the Father is the head of his son. And this principle of headship actually operates in the whole family, the whole universe, right? Because the head of all of the angels is actually Christ. In fact, let's go to the book of Colossians. I believe this is going to be Colossians chapter 1. Yes, verse 15. We're reading there, speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body and the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And I believe in Colossians chapter 2, it's going to say he's also the head of the angels by using the language of principalities. So we saw back there in chapter one that all things, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers were created by God through Christ. And this is now Colossians 2, verse 9 and 10, which says, for in him, that's Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and powers. So there's this chain of headship that where God the Father is the head of Christ, and then Christ is the head of all the principalities and powers. That means he's the leader of, over all the angelic hosts, and he's also the head of humanity, right? So he holds the headship over all creation, for the Father has appointed his Son to that position. Manuscript 43b. The creation of our world was brought into the councils of heaven. There the covering cherub prepared his request that he should be made prince to govern the world then in prospect. This was not accorded him. Jesus Christ was to rule the earthly kingdom. Under God, he engaged to take the world with all its probabilities. The law of heaven should be the standard law for this new world for human intelligences. So what's happening here is that Lucifer is actually trying to get a change in the law where he's saying, listen, instead of Jesus being the prince to govern this new world that's being discussed, let it be me. I want to be the one to rule. And of course, this was not accorded to him. That means God the Father rejected his request. And he made it clear that Jesus was going to rule the earthly kingdom under God. That was the law of heaven. And we saw in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, the Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. And this now moving forward to Manuscript 90, 1910, says Lucifer was the most beautiful angel in the heavenly courts next to Jesus Christ. But Christ was one with God, assimilated to the image of God to do the will of God. Satan, knowing that Christ had the first place next to God, began to insinuate to the angels that he should be next to God. So Jesus was begotten as the express image of God. He was assimilated to the Father's image. He was the one to do God's will. And Satan knew that. He knew the order, but he wanted to try to change it. And that's what the great controversy is really about. It's about Satan trying to change the law of God. And in order to do that, he had to deny the nature of the only begotten Son of God to make it seem like the Father was being unfair in having this Son exalted above all the rest. 
But the point here is that Christ is ruling, he's functioning under God. Bible Echo, July 23rd, 1900. Christ's time, and this is now speaking about Christ when he was incarnated, Christ's time to show his divine power had not yet come. He was fully aware of the glory he had with the Father before the world was. That's amazing. So he's consciously fully aware of the glory that he used to have. Now let's see what it says. But then, that's meaning back before the world was, when he was in his full glory, but then he willingly submitted to the divine will, and he was unchanged now. Amazing. Remember, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So even in his full glory, existing in the form of God, right? He willingly submitted to his Father. And when he came to become one of us, he was unchanged. So let's review our points. Point one. God spoke to his begotten son saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Point two, the pre-incarnate son was begotten in the express image of the father. Point three, the son was the father's glory. The material of the son was a part of God himself. He was of one substance with his father. Point four, the woman was made as a suitable helper for the man. And point five, the pre-incarnate son was under God. So now let's tie it all together. Um, we'll start with point five, right? And we're noticing how there's a parallel between Adam and Eve and between God and his only begotten son. And we read this verse already, right? That the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman or the wife is the man, the husband, and the head of Christ is God. So what we're seeing here is that there's a parallel between God, who is the head of his son, and the husband, who is the head of his wife. And that is Adam and Eve. And so remember, Romans 1 says we could understand about the Godhead by the things that were made. Specifically, it's going to be Adam and Eve. Point four, we saw that Eve was made as a suitable helper for Adam. Well, guess what the only begotten Son of God is? Patriots and Prophets, page 34, tells us that the sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate his purposes and share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 1 and 2. Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. And uh, Sister White's going to continue on there to quote from Isaiah and Micah 5 and then Proverbs 8, verse 22 to 30, which, by the way, uh, Proverbs 8, verse 30 uses a word. It's the Hebrew word aman, and that word can actually be translated as a master worker or a master craftsman. So it's suggesting that God the Father begot his son, and this son was his helper. It was his master craftsman, the one who was going to be the active agency whereby God would create all things. And just, it's so amazing. How does Adam create? Adam creates children, right, in his image and likeness through Eve, his suitable helper. She's of the same nature as him, one that's equal to him, who can understand and appreciate his purposes and share in that, right? It's an amazingly beautiful thing. Let's move forward to points three and point two. Point three was that the sun is God's glory and the material of the sun is a part of God himself, right? And point two is that the sun was begotten. Well, how does that parallel with Adam and Eve? We read in Genesis chapter 2, 
verse 21 through 23, that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So here we're actually seeing a physical likeness of God and his begotten son with Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve are created, so they're finite. They can never fully explain God or his son, but they help us to understand to a limited degree the ontology, that is the nature of God and his son. So like the father, brought forth his son of one substance. Well, when Eve was created, she was, a rib was taken, brought forth out from Adam, and that was the basis for the creation of Eve. That's why Patriarchs and Prophets tells us she was a part of himself. That's the same language we saw with Christ being a part of God himself. Okay? We mentioned also that Christ was the brightness of the Father's glory. Well, look what 1 Corinthians 11 verse 7 says about the wife in relationship to the man. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman or the wife is the glory of the man or the husband. So there's this reflection even in the glory, right? That where Eve was the glory of Adam, right? Well, Christ is the glory of his father. So let's go to our final point. And that is when God said to his son, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We see that this was actually something that God said in the presence or the angels heard it right and lucifer actually got up a warfare over the fact that christ was the only begotten son of god and he tried to hide it this is letter 42 1910 this fact the angels would obscure that christ was the only begotten son of god and they came to consider that they were not to consult christ one angel began the controversy and carried it on until there was rebellion in the heavenly courts. Now, I'm not going to read all the rest of this. I'd recommend you guys check it out when you have time because it actually reveals that Satan is trying to argue that Jesus was just an angel when in reality he's the only begotten Son of God. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that the angels were confused about these things and they didn't understand it. So when God made this announcement, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and then proceeded to create Adam from the dust, and then proceeded to create Eve from a rib taken out from Adam, all of the lights would have gone off in the angelic minds to say, ah, now we see, now we better understand who Christ is as the only begotten Son of God and what makes him different from us, right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, actually, if you read it, when Paul is talking there, he has this little reference in verse 10, says, For this cause ought the woman to have power over her head because of the angels. And so I believe that the human family, the way that God created Adam and Eve was actually an object lesson to help even the angels better understand why Lucifer was wrong in the great controversy and why only Christ, the only begotten son of God, could be equal to himself. He was the son of God's very substance. If you stop and... and um, read the scriptures, you'll see something amazing because the Bible teaches that Adam and Eve 
they are two separate bodies of flesh, yet the scripture says that they are one flesh. And of course, Adam is the personal name of the world's first man. But later on in Genesis, the Bible says that God called their name Adam. So Eve, even though she has her own name, she also shares Adam's name. And so there's just so many parallels because the son, right, he also has his father's name. And there's this relationship, this oneness between the father and the son that they have. Yes, they're two separate beings, each with his own bodily form, yet they have a oneness in spirit, right? And so what we're really seeing here, through these five points, we have strong evidence of a parallelism between God and his only begotten son and Adam and Eve. And through the things that God has made, specifically Adam and Eve, we are guided in the correct way to help us to understand. And in practical application, realizing this, this exalted status of who Christ really is, right, should help us to love the Father and the Son more because the Father gave up his most cherished person. The person who was a part of himself, the son of his very uh, material, right, to come to us. And that son, who being in that form, decided to come down to lower himself. It, it's just, it's an unbelievable condescension. And this is the basis of the gospel and what we are being called back into. So let's ask God to help us by his spirit that we can have the mind of Christ and partake of this glorious, wonderful truth and live it out and have that same type of approach to others to help bring them into this truth as well. All right, brothers and sisters, that is it. And may God bless you. And I hope uh, you've gained some understanding. And if you want to go over this material, it's on the website as it reads, how Adam and Eve parallel God and his begotten son. Father in heaven, thank you for helping me to share this material, the short notice of things, but I pray God that this information would help us, that your Holy Spirit comes to us as the spirit of truth. So help us to know the truth about you and about your son and help this to become a part of us that were the same mind that is in your son, that same mind would be in us, that we might be living personifications of the gospel, that we might be an epistle that can be read by all people, and that they can see the Lord Jesus himself through us by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we fall short of your glory continually. But we thank you that your son has never fallen short and that his glory is so great that he's going to bring us into glory as well. We confess our sins. We ask forgiveness. We pray for our brothers and sisters that they too might have the same experience and be a part of it. We pray your blessing upon the camp meeting that's happening over in Tennessee. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Seventh-day Adventist Church who may not yet see these things, that you would show them the light and you would bring them into closer relationship with yourself, especially as we are moving forward into this very last period of Earth's history when everything that can be shaken will be shaken and there is trouble in front of us. Secure us in the mind of Christ. Help his thoughts to be our thoughts. Make it so much so, Lord, that we don't even see any difference between, that we are just in natural harmony with you in our spirits. We love you and we are grateful for all that you have done and are continuing to do for us through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.